No. No, I haven't. Uh, no, although when I first read Titanic, I was sent a treatment for it, um, which was 140 pages long. <laughs> And the, the, and the first draft of the script that I read was 190 to 200 pages long. And on average, a script is 100 and, between 118 and maybe 132, 132 being quite lengthy. So, um, but that, that, that's the only time. But I did, when I read the treatment, I thought, oh my God, wow, if I could do this. When I read the treatment for Titanic, I really remember that feeling. Um, and I still have it actually, that, that treatment, and I found it not too long ago. I was going through some things in England and, uh, and all over the front. I fucking love this. <laughs> <laughs> I've written <that>. big letters. <laughs> Sorry, I just cursed. <laughs> First one of the night. Um, uh, but no, usually a script, yeah, it's, it's usually a completed script when it, when it gets sent through, yeah. Because uh, when you hear stories, no one sets out to make a bad movie. Nobody ever wants to make a bad movie. But when you read some of the post-mortems on bad movies that do get made, as often as not, they say, well, we didn't have a finished script, we had to start shooting, we had to start date, all that kind of thing. Maybe that's part of why you've done so well, is you, you, you've had scripts. You know what you're getting into. I mean, you never know entirely. There's still, you know, the stars have to align properly. But, but you, you, you've chosen good scripts. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, the, the script is really, it's really everything um, for me, and uh, and the director obviously is incredibly important as well. Um, but as long as there's a feeling that this, this script is structurally watertight, um, and there's room for manoeuvre um, once discussions happen and rehearsals start to happen and so on, um, it's really everything for me. Bring it up to your 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 current work and uh, and all the accolades that have come your way as a result of them. Uh, I guess people, I'm sure people impose their feelings on you or their thoughts on you, and a lot of people project onto uh, people they see on the screen and on television and such. But what I'd like to hear what you think about praise and awards. Not, not so much physical awards or literal awards, but what does praise mean to you? You were obviously elated at the Golden Globes. You had every right to be. Uh, what does that mean to you? Well, I think <clears throat> praise, from, praise from the right places is a great thing. But pr praise from a place that you don't often know where it's coming from can be a mixed blessing, I think. And I think that's partly why I don't read reviews. Because it's, it's as much to do with not wanting to read the good things as not wanting to read the bad things. Because if you hear too much of a good thing, well, you know, you can get a little bit kind of, hmm, hmm, pleased with myself. I never want to be pleased with myself. Never. I never want to be smug. I never want to be patting myself on the back and saying, well, I got that right, or yes, I did it. I never want to have that feeling. Because if I have that feeling, then how, I feel like how would I, how would I hang on to my own sense of self and my own vision and, 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 and the desire to do my best all the time. I, I would be really frightened to lose that. Um, and awards, I think, it's incredible, but I also think there's a time and a place too. Um, and I know what it feels like to lose. And uh, it's not great. But it's also really okay. You know, and on the occasions that I've been to the Academy Awards in the past and I haven't won, um, I have always known that I wasn't going to win. I've absolutely known that I wasn't going to. I've just been so thrilled to be there and, and be included. Um, and that's how I feel this year. I feel I was so lucky with those Golden Globe Awards. My God, I was so so lucky, and really, truly, did not expect even one, let alone two. Honestly, I didn't. And 
and I was uh, anyway, yeah, shocked. <laughs> um, but that's a great feeling, you know, to have that happen to me at the age of 33, especially coming off the back of two years that have been really pivotal for me in my life personally, and for me as an actress, the things that I have learned and the challenges that I've been faced with. I mean, it, playing April Wheeler and then playing Hannah Schmidt, I mean, it pushed me into emotional places that I've never visited before at all in my life. And, um, you know, you feel quite vulnerable when that happens. And particularly with Hannah um, in The Reader, you know, we only finished the film in July and, uh, and suddenly it was coming out. And so by October, the end of October, I was talking about it and talking about it to, to journalists, complete strangers who wanted to know how I felt and what I thought and get my opinion. And quite honestly, I wasn't ready to give it. I wasn't ready to share it. I hadn't processed it. So what would happen was I'd find myself rather pathetically giving interviews and I would just get really emotional, sort of cry and say, my God, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I'm crying. It's just that I haven't thought this through yet. I'm still kind of in shock about having had this experience of playing this very complicated person. Um, and that's the side of the job that I will always find hard, I think, is, is doing the press. Because sometimes people ask you a question and you have to give them an answer, but you don't always want to share that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Even with your dearest friends, you might not want to. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to the praise thing. It's, you know, it, it can be a double-edged sword, but at the right time and, and from the right place too, I think.